how do you measure the achievement of a nation? If you want to know how we're really doing, where do you look? Maybe that's a question with more than just one answer. Maybe you have to take one thing at a time and ask how we're handling that problem. Take food, for example. That's an important problem. How are we doing there? Take a look at our farms. The quantity and quality of our output surpass anything ever seen before. And how about industrial production? That's probably where we do the most remarkable job of all. This is the kind of thing we have a special knack for. We have a right to be proud of our performance as builders and makers of goods. How about transportation? The same story, really. More than 200,000 miles of railroads, 300 mile an hour planes by the thousands, 40 million cars and trucks. Or look what we've done with health. Physical well-being tremendously improved. Life expectancy at the highest level in history by far. And how have we managed to do all this? We provided tools for the job. Farm tools to multiply our output per acre. Giant machines to multiply our output per man. When it comes to moving people and goods, we have the tools to do it on a grand scale. We have every right to be proud of our performance in these areas of our national life. But what about the education of our children? Let's look at that problem. Have we the same right to be proud of what we are doing for them? Every school day of the year, 30 million young people enter the classrooms of our schools. Never before in our history has the school population been so big. Never before have we had greater need for knowledge, or wisdom, or understanding. Today's school generation must be trained to face a complex, rapidly changing world. Think of it a moment. It is a world that has seen the coming of the atomic bomb and all the problems that go with it. It is a world in which supersonic speeds are commonplace. It is a world that in a span of little more than 20 years saw this. And then this. It has seen the first attempt in history at world organization and the fate of a second attempt still hangs in the balance. It has seen extreme economic depression and high economic prosperity. It has seen the rise of the total state, the dictator, and the mass man. It is a world that has revealed whole new areas of knowledge. It is a world of new sensations, new excitements, new distractions, the thrills of motion pictures, the tense drama of radio, the vivid presentations of television. So much to be learned by so many in so little time. That is the problem. And what money, manpower, and tools are we providing for this job? This is a question we must address to every aspect of the problem. School buildings, equipment, teachers' loads, teachers' salaries, the training of teachers, and the tools for learning. The supremely important job of teaching deserves the best we can provide. More books and better ones. More audiovisual materials and better ones. More teaching materials of all kinds, each suited to a special task of communication. For education is communication. It is the communications problem we consider here. We want to explore the tools of audiovisual education, and especially the educational motion picture. Why try to explain the workings of a gasoline engine with words and gestures alone, when films can do it this way? The four cycles are intake, compression, explosion, exhaustion. Why depend entirely upon verbal explanations and static drawings to portray life in foreign lands when motion pictures can do this. We work very hard. Everyone must help with the work if the camp is to be ready by nightfall. We must have books to teach the great events of history. But why use books alone when films can help so much to make these events come alive? So many needing to learn so much in 
in so little time. How do these new audiovisual tools measure up to this job? Well, let's see. Here is the classroom of Miss Mildred Mahoney of the University of Chicago Laboratory School. To most of these primary grade children, farm life had been vague and remote. Then one day they saw a film about a fair. Faces in the line. At last the choice is made. The judge's work is done. He has picked the winners. Well, the champion's blue ribbon goes to a girl. Johnny gets a ribbon, too. His calf is a winner. Here are some of the activities that grew out of the common experience of the class. Making a model is only one activity growing out of the film showing. Books especially designed to go with the film help the pupils to read about the experience with ease and with understanding. Johnny goes to the barn. He shines the horns of his calf. Besides using the film readers, the pupils took a great deal of interest in other books dealing with the animals, the farm, and other things related to what they saw in the film. Some wanted to put the story into their own words. Some drew pictures. Just as these city youngsters went to a fair by means of films, they can use films to gain rich experience in a wide variety of other subject areas. The world of physical things. How do gears work? The world of science and technology. How is nylon made? The world of living things, young animals. The rich past of colonial times. The world of the arts. How do you draw a good picture? The world of handicrafts. How does a loom work? And the world of people, young people like themselves in Norway, in England, and young people in Italy. These children are learning to understand the world they live in through films. The general science class of Mr. P.L. Whitaker, University School, Bloomington, Indiana. Now we have a pretty good list of questions. Do you think of any other points that we ought to see in this film on television, Pamela? What makes the electrons, or whatever they're called, come together and form the shape for the picture? That's what I don't understand. Good. Let's add that. What makes the shape or pattern of the picture? Is there anything else? Well, then let's see the film. Don, will you close the shades? At the base of the tube is a filament. Fitting over the filament is the cathode, a cylinder coated with earth oxides. Around the cathode is a shield called the control grid. Next are two anodes. This is only one of many science films from a comprehensive library which includes motion pictures on physics, motion pictures on chemistry, films on biology. Teachers like Mr. Whitaker have found that their investment in the use of films has yielded rich returns in promoting interest, clarifying difficult concepts, and increasing the effectiveness of teaching. The history class of Mr. John Hamburg, Edgerton, Wisconsin Public Schools. It is therefore that the older I grow, the more apt I am to doubt my own judgment and to pay attention to the judgment of others. Sir, I cannot help expressing a wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it would, with me, doubt a little of his infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity, put his name to this 
instrument. Any comments? Yes, Bob. I guess I was surprised to see Franklin so willing to admit that he might be wrong sometimes. Anyone want to comment on that? Oh, I think the film makes clear from the beginning that Franklin was a scientist as well as a statesman. You know, that's a very impressive thing about the founders of our government. They were men of really broad interests. To Mr. Hamburg's class, men like Franklin, Jefferson, and many, many others are not just vague historical figures, but vivid personalities they have met in a very meaningful sense through films. And so too, with their entire study of American history, films give it a new dimension. Films, textbooks, and other materials reinforcing each other. When the period of the movement westward was being studied, this film was used. In a century and a half, a frontier people had remade a continent. Virtually all productive land At another been... point in the course, there was a film dealing with the Second World War. After that, a film on the United Nations. The independent member states of the United Nations seek by means of these five great bodies to maintain the peace. Democracy. Discussions like this are typical of the interest that films help create. I don't see how you can talk about degrees of democracy and despotism like the film said. Either you have a democracy or you haven't. That's what I think, too. If it's just a matter of degree, then all systems are the same. That's not what the film said. The point was that you can't just go around using words like democracy and despotism without knowing what they mean. That's right. One of the first things any dictator tries to do is fool the people with words they don't understand. And get all excited about. Some people can't even exercise. Well, I, 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 I think everybody's got a point there. If I may get in a word here, there are two distinctly different types of questions involved. One is a question of fact. What did the film actually say? The other is a question of opinion. Should we believe what the film said? We ought to be able to settle the first question rather easily. Can we see the film again? Shall we see it again? Mm -hmm. Charlie, are you all set? The sixth grade class of Mrs. Bessie Southcombe of the Cincinnati, Ohio Public Schools. A call for it. <laughs> On another occasion, the film selected had to do with personal hygiene. She washes her face at least every morning and evening. She rubs gently all over her face. And then there was the film on the teeth. The rotary strokes massage the gums and stimulate blood circulation. And there was the film on caring for the hair. A hundred strokes or more. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But it's worth taking the time for. With materials like these to work with, Mrs. Southcombe's class was able to save costly hours of classroom time in their study of health problems. These are not isolated examples. Similar cases of effective film use can be cited in all areas of the school program and at all age levels. For instance, to the art class of Mr. Harlan E. Hoffa of the Evanston, Illinois schools comes the skilled artist. Students have the experience of seeing a great artist at work. The engineering class of Professor Richard H. Cole of Northwestern University. A lucid and straightforward demonstration of the meaning of vectors. The teacher training group of Mr. R. E. Peaty of the University of Chicago gets a new insight into child development. The importance of the child's questions and how they are answered. And for adult groups like this, the films provide a common experience for a group discussion. Films are only part of a broad movement in the audiovisual field. Film strips, records, magnetic recordings, models, charts, radio and television are also new tools for enlightenment. 
To promote a wider and more effective use of these tools, states, counties, and cities have appointed professional audio-visual directors to provide leadership in the field. Universities have established centers for teacher training and research in audio-visual education. The U.S. Office of Education and other civilian government agencies have training film programs. Industry and the armed forces continue to use the audio-visual tools that have been so effective in the speedy training of large numbers of men and women. Mr. Clarence Randall, president of a large steel corporation, said, I hold the deep conviction that training films are an important aid to the development of education in industry. They are direct, they are inexpensive, and they teach people not only the how, but the why of doing things the safe way and the smart way. Admiral Halsey of the Armed Forces said, When time was precious, the Navy turned to the medium of the motion pictures for technically accurate and educationally sound instruction. Research centers such as this one at Pennsylvania State College are constantly adding to our knowledge of films and their effective use. A growing number of city school systems have central points for the distribution of films, and more than ever before, individual schools are fighting to get the facilities they need to make the use of films and other audiovisual materials a regular part of classroom instruction. Yet even with all this, most students in American classrooms do not have the opportunities offered by regular film use. We must not assume that the new media of communication will answer all our problems, or that they will make the teacher less important. On the contrary, well-trained teachers will be needed more than ever before. But the teacher's effectiveness will increase with the proper use of films, just as the latest advances in medical equipment increase the effectiveness of the doctor, just as the farmer's effectiveness is increased through the power tools of modern agriculture, just as our giant productive system is made more effective through the use of a modernized transportation system, just as our industrial workers have been provided the tools an age of economic well-being requires. The problem is to help the children learn to make the school years as profitable and productive as possible. Are we solving this vital problem with the best facilities and finest resources at our command? How do you measure the achievement of a nation? If you want to know how we're really doing, take a look at our schools. For on what we're doing here and in schools throughout the world rests not only our future fate, but perhaps the very fate of civilization itself.